Welcome back to Your Rich on 120. I'm Jeff Clint, and this is a series of 120 videos of things that I learned as a student at the University of Virginia. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about proofs, and in particular, proofs that argue by contradiction or by absurdity. Uh, and so this little symbol is going to come up a lot. And what this symbol means is that a contradiction has been reached, or an impossibility has happened, or the argument has gone wrong. Uh, and the something needs to be changed about it. Um, so I haven't really drawn out very many proofs yet in this series, so let's just kind of look at an example proof. So it's going to start with uh, us kind of drawing this line to signify that we, we're making an assumption. So this A uh, is what we're assuming to be true. Uh, A could be it is raining, and uh, we, we could add something to this uh, that uh, perhaps we prove in, in another proof or that we have reason to believe. It's kind of another assumption too, but uh, we'll kind of justify it on the right hand side here that it is the rule thing that we're referring to number one. So A then B or B always follows A. So this could be, if it's raining, you know, then I could get wet. And from that we can conclude A, A then B, B. Okay? So this is just what A then B means in the presence of A, is that we can get to conclude B. And then that is kind of where we are in the argument. Eventually we'll get to a desired end state E, and then we'll say we're done, we've concluded, we've got a result, which by the way, if you go back to the can you use the result, this is the result that you want to see if this plugs into anything else that you know about, or if you can draw any conclusions from that. Uh, but generally this is how proofs are going to look, something like this. And the kinds of proof that we're interested in kind of talking about today are ones where we have A, you know, some statement, some uh, premise, some predicate, or, or anything that will have a truth value associated with it. Um, then there's not A, which is expressing the opposite of that. So it is raining, it is not raining. If you try to kind of use both of them together, uh, it's not possible to believe both that it is raining and that it is not raining together. And so we write, a contradiction has occurred. And from that, and here's the, the thing that is interesting, is we can then conclude whatever we want after that. Because once we've kind of led ourselves to a contradiction, in the context of what we have, have assumed, and the fact that we can kind of enter in and justify this other thing uh, for whatever reason, then as long as we're in the, the scope kind of allowed by the, the contradiction being present here, we can conclude whatever we want from that. Uh, again, that doesn't mean that this B is true, it just means that if you assume A, then B is true. And so this is a powerful kind of argument because you can kind of conclude really general things from it. And in fact, it's kind of, if you think about it, how Descartes, going back to the Descartes video, really approached everything. And uh, so sometimes it, it's unclear what, uh, usually how you use this argument is that you uh, basically get to the point where you have A and then not A or a contradiction. So because we assumed this to start with, this is what we didn't know going in, so we just took it for granted that it was going to be true, and so therefore, you know, not A is actually true, uh, is usually how this kind of argument is, is constructed, or at least that we don't know A. Uh, and so what Descartes would have done is he would have basically taken this uh, and, and kind of looked at it generally. And so you, what you can do is you can kind of pick it apart either at this level, where the assumption is taking place, or anything else that you kind of fed in uh, from external proofs or anything else you've, you've kind of brought in uh, as kind of a 
part of your argument justifying the conclusion that not a uh, in this particular case. So what De Descartes did, again, uh, would have basically looked to have taken all of his beliefs and realized that there were some contradictions involved in some of them. And so he started peeling away more and more layers of, of the assumptions that he had made about the world until, again, he had found something where there was some absolute certainty where there was no contradiction left. And so therefore he could not conclude anything Never mind, you know, the opposite of the things that uh, kind of people read. Uh, because again, anything will follow from a contradiction, as unintuitive as that actually is. And so, uh, this, like anything else, this is a tool, uh, or, or like a lot of things, this is a tool. And you have to use it carefully. So, uh, again, you can't just conclude B uh, without looking at the context that this happens when you assume A. Uh, but the if, if you do use it carefully, uh, it, it's a, an important tool in your toolkit because you're using your inability to imagine things. You're, you're using your ignorance of, of how multiple things can occur at once to justify believing or, or dealing with the rest of your ignorance or the rest of your uncertainty. So it's, it's kind of like using uh, heat to uh, kind of, which is just disordered particles uh, in, in general, uh, to, to kind of heat food, right? You're, you're kind of using the, the the lack of your knowledge in one area as a, a tool to kind of cut out knowledge in another. But in general, once you've thrown out logical consistency uh, in your belief system, you can come up with anything, and you can you can justify really absurd uh, and uh, nonsensical things with horrible consequences if you actually start acting upon those beliefs. So this is going to be related to uh, other things we've talked about. Um, for starters, the dimensional analysis video, because uh, usually how dimensional analysis is going to work in practice is you could basically have A B, the type of the, the side of the equation is in meters, and then not A will be the type of the equation is in something not near. And then therefore you've got a contradiction, therefore you can conclude something basically from that. Uh, which the thing that you conclude that makes the most sense is that the equation was set up incorrectly. Uh, so uh, it's going to be related to the different approaches because this is one approach that you can use in a lot of different areas. Uh, again, if you kind of know how to use it properly. It's related to the Occam's razor video because this, the fewer contradictions that your belief system has or the subset of your belief system has, the, the simpler it is and the less kind of degrees of infinite freedom that you have uh, to kind of conclude things from it. You want your particular belief system to have none of these and to only be able to kind of believe things that are true, only be able to generate things to believe that are true. Uh, if, if you believe, you know, Taking, for example, the if by whiskey approach, where it's like if by whiskey uh, you mean the you know devilish fire water, uh, then no, I don't support. And if by whiskey you mean you know the, the stuff that gentlemen drink, then yes, I do support it. Well, again, you know you're you're not constraining yourself to believe any particular thing. You're basically allowing yourself to believe everything. You're allowing yourself to have any opinion whatsoever. You want your system of belief to actually constrain what is possible for you to believe and only make that the true things that uh, are actually worth believing. It's also related to the affirmative conclusion from negative premises video because this is, if you think about it, kind of, uh, you're, you're concluding something based on nothing. Same thing with the argument from ignorance uh, and the argument from silence. You're, you're concluding something in the context of this, but it's worth pointing out that it's not just in the context of a contradiction. It's in the context of a contradiction inside of the greater context of some assumption being made. And so really you're not concluding something based on ignorance uh, or negative premises because you're doing so using the fact that there was an assumption made that is then broken, that is then kind of justified as being not worth believing uh, by the presence of this contradiction. Uh, it's related to the argument from incredulity. Uh, video for kind of similar reasons in that uh, when you hit this, this is a spot where logically you should be incredulous, where you should kind of say, okay, well, 
this is not worth believing. Therefore, we have to be a little bit more open-minded here about the conclusions that we can accept. It's related to the epistemology and artificial intelligence video because, uh, again, if, if you're thinking about what a system can know, uh, and the system is able to know contradictory things, then you've broken something. And you're no longer dealing with a system that can know things. And unfortunately, the human brain, uh, the way that it works, can often believe things that are kind of mutually inconsistent. There's a term for it, cognitive dissonance. Uh, it's just something that, unfortunately, we're plagued with. Uh, and so we're not kind of consistent reasoners. And to the extent that that is true, we're not all that intelligent. Uh, it's related to the mu video because of the kind of mu uh, is what you say when you kind of encounter the situation in a question that you're being asked uh, where the only answer is kind of both of these things. Uh, so it kind of gets you into a, the state where you can then start concluding things outside the box from it. There are some proofs that have to be done or, or where it's very likely that they have to be done by proof by contradiction. But it depends how you define your terms as far as whether or not this is actually true. Uh, it may be that there is uh, no set of definitions that only admit positive proofs uh, once you start dealing with complex enough things that need proof uh, in a powerful enough, well-formatted system. Uh, again, this is something that I have to prove. So if you want to go prove this, or it's you know, the opposite, go hard, see if you can do that. It would be interesting to see either way. But let's kind of take a look at some examples of this. So one, one example would be, what is the largest in integer, or kind of largest whole number? And we could say, OK, well, a is the largest number. And you could say, well, it's an integer, so a plus 1 is a valid number. And we know this because what it means to be an integer is that uh, it, it, the, the set of integers is what's called closed in the operation of addition. So you can, uh, for any integer, add another integer to it, and the resultant integer will also be an integer. So therefore, uh, because a is the largest integer, uh, a is larger than this a plus 1 number. Now, whenever we have an inequality like this, uh, if you may remember, you can add or, add or subtract the equal value to either side. So we could have a plus 1 minus 1 is less than a minus 1. We could have a is less than a minus 1. And if we go back up here, let's just compare it here. We got uh, a is greater than a plus 1 is less than a minus 1. So that means that a plus 1 is less than a, which is also less than a minus 1. So we're just going to get rid of this middle term. So a plus 1 is less than a minus 1. And let's subtract a from both sides. So we should have a minus a is 0. And a minus a is 0. And that leaves us with 1 is less than minus 1, which is false. This is a contradiction. Therefore, our initial assumption here that a is the largest integer is false. And we have had a, the end of our proof. So this is kind of an example proof where you can use this kind of contradiction. Where you can prove something that isn't true. And when you get to that point, then something you introduced before you got to this kind of point here that was introduced in error. And you can pick apart bit by bit uh, which one it is. But in this case, we only introduced one thing. 
that A is the largest integer. Uh, in principle, uh, you could argue that uh, it's not that A is the largest is wrong, it's that uh, your kind of set of integers uh, aren't closed under addition. Uh, but in that case, uh, you're no longer dealing with or integers because it, what integer means is for this property to apply. If that property didn't apply, then you wouldn't be talking about integers, and then whatever set you were talking about may have uh, a largest member. Uh, there are many sets that do have a largest member. Um, let's try another one. So uh, imagine if there's a largest prime number P. So that would mean that there would have to be no numbers uh, larger than it that were also prime. But P is an integer. And uh, so that means that we can multiply integers by other integers and get still uh, other integers. The set of integers is closed under the operation of multiplication. So. So P itself is prime. So P times Q is not, of course, prime because uh, P times two Q has two factors, P and Q, uh, P of which is prime. Who cares about Q? But this means that this plus one, which is also part of the set of integers, is also uh, is a member of the set of integers. But what's w interesting about this number is what are the factors of this number? Uh, it really only has, uh, well, it has none because the largest prime, so uh, the, o the, um, the, the, there is no more prime numbers that would divide this. So if, if you had a, a factor of this, it would have to be larger than Q uh, in order to divide it. And so this itself is prime. Therefore, by similar reasoning from this, we can kind of derive that, you know, that this is a contradiction because it's bigger than P. P is the biggest prime, and so this has to be bigger than this. And again, when you just walk through the numbers, you'll eventually get to a contradiction. And then from that, you can conclude that the original thing we assumed, this P is the largest prime number, uh, is false. So again, th th these are just kind of trivial examples, uh, things that uh, you know everyone knows that there's you know, no highest number. This one isn't quite so uh, obvious when you first start thinking about it. Uh, but uh, again, it just goes to show that there are things that you can prove once you start proving uh, contradictory results. Uh, and even in things, uh, especially once you start writing long tracts of text, long kind of collections of things that you assume to be true. Uh, so for example, the King James Bible, a lot of people kind of assume that the entire book is true without errors, without anything. And yet, if you look, you'll find contradictions. And that means, within the context of that book, you can argue for anything. Uh, and that is not something that we necessarily want to do. Uh, if you do you know, want to believe something, make sure that it doesn't kind of lead you to these kinds of contra contradictions. Uh, because, again, you, you want to kind of constrain what you believe to only be uh, true things to the greatest extent that you possibly can. So, uh, if you're interested in other proofs by contradiction, uh, feel free to ask for them. Um, we could uh, walk through this one a little bit more here. That sort of thing. But uh, again, it, it, it's it's uh, something that you'll want to kind of look out for. So uh, practice using it. See if you can kind of come up with better proofs than these, perhaps. Uh,
but uh, kind of feel free to enjoy this series, and hopefully we'll see you in the next video.